Good afternoon and welcome back to another edition of NCIA's Industry Essentials Educational Webinars. I'm Brian Gilbert and I'm thrilled to kick off another episode of NCIA's Committee Insights Series today, our long running and premier educational program produced in partnership with NCIA's 15 member led and sector specific committees. For today's program, NCIA's Retail Committee has convened an all-star panel of leading investors, entrepreneurs, and C-suite executives alongside retail and marketing experts to, to discuss how the time to move the needle for women in cannabis is gone. It's time to change the game. You'll leave today's uh, session with a set of actionable solutions to implement to get your business and our industry back on track. But as I mentioned, don't forget this is an interactive experience, so don't hesitate to post those questions throughout the session and our panel will address during a dedicated Q&A period before we close it out. All right, enough with this intro. To kick things off, I'd like to welcome our moderator for today's program, Janine Moss, member of NCIA's Retail Committee, as well as CEO and founder of Outfront Solutions to the virtual stage here. Welcome to NCIA's Industry Essentials. Great to have you here, Janine. You can activate your video feed and join me up here on the virtual stage. Fantastic. Um, well, with that, I'll turn it right over to you to introduce yourself, um, let everybody know about sort of the development of the program amongst our different working groups over the last few months, and dive right into the intro for the session. Excellent. Well, welcome, everybody. So glad you're here with us today. Um, I'm Janine Moss. As uh, Brian mentioned, I am a member of the Retail Committee. I'm the former chair of the Marketing and Advertising Committee, so I'm a longtime supporter of NCIA believing really strongly that when I'm part of an industry, I have to contribute to it and that a rising tide will float all boats. So thank you for being here and helping make that happen. So um, uh, as, as Brian also mentioned, I am the co-founder of Outfront Solutions, which is a branding, marketing and business development firm. And we seek to increase the visibility, growth and valuation of our clients' companies. Many of those companies are cannabis, but even more are in technology, and we have a really big practice in women's advancement. So we're working every day to see women and minorities enter all kinds of industries. Um, we have this incredible lineup of panelists who are going to be clicking on momentarily, and you're going to hear from them today. I'm not going to go into their LinkedIn profiles, because we're going to give you a link for that. Instead, I'm going to tell you a little bit more about them when I start answer, asking the questions, because I really want you to hear from them. They're longtime advocates, long time in this industry. But let's take another second just to thank NCIA for being here and for convening us and for bringing an education uh, into to our industry and being a national representative, uh, representative of our interests. We really need that and we need to grow it more. Also, a special shout out to our Facebook friends because this is also being broadcast live on Facebook. So uh, many of you here today probably know me. I see a lot of uh, friends and colleagues as the former uh, CEO and founder of Anabe, which was the first odor-proof luxury accessories to help women carry their cannabis. Now, the reason I started um, Anabi is because as the industry got going, um, I saw that women were not being recognized. It was as if we didn't exist. And that has made me angry in many times during my long career, and I always do something about it. So um, I started Anabi. Uh, I, I saw that nobody saw we were here, and yet I knew that we were, uh, because I'm one of them, the long term. Uh, consumer, uh, but we were invisible, just like we've been invisible to car manufacturers, to banks, to credit card companies in the past, and now we're primary customers for them. This is the same opportunity that we're looking at for, in the cannabis industry in regard to women, um, but there are some hurdles, and we're going to be talking about some of those. In 2017, MJ Biz uh, said that women, they, they pegged us at 37% of all executive positions in cannabis. Last year, in 2021, the number was 22%. So we're down 15%. 
We're trending in the wrong direction, folks. This can't continue. So uh, a huge problem starts at the very beginning with funding. You know, only 2% of women get venture capital funding in the United States. And only 0.006% of that goes to women of color. So when it comes to exec and, and when it comes to executive uh, women in cannabis investment firms, there's only 4.6% that are female, and we have them here today. I'm, I'm just kidding. But uh, indeed, it's a very small number. So uh, what this means is that the, the, nobody's really minding the store when it comes to serving what will probably be the most significant customer group in the cannabis industry going forward. So in putting together this uh, panel and talking with all these incredible people, it became abundantly clear that the, it is uh, serving women is broken along the entire value chain in the cannabis industry. So we're gonna address that today. And by the way, don't put us in any pink ghetto where you take a product and you wrap it up in some pink packaging, you say it's for women and you charge twice as much. This is not the, the successful way to go after the women's market. So what do we want? How can the cannabis uh, companies take advantage of this opportunity of appealing to women? That's what we're gonna talk about today. And at the end of the session, we have a list of 32 actionable solutions you can take, things you can actually do right now to advance women and get things uh, uh, rocking and rolling in the right direction. So without a, another moment, let's get started. I'm going to um, tell you a little bit and, and uh, introduce our panelists. So Wendy, will you come on board? Um, and I'm gonna tell you a little bit about Wendy. Uh, Wendy, uh, her name kept coming up as I was looking for a panelist to join us today. And it kept coming up in relation to women who she mentors in the cannabis industry. Now, Wendy has had this amazing uh, career. She's been super successful in real estate. And she, she went on and she's now a board member of Green Thumb Industries. She's been working for women throughout that effort. Um, she's taken, as an investor, she's taken multiple positions supporting women entrepreneurs, but she just doesn't give them money. She also gives them a huge amount of strategic support. So, uh, you know, uh, at some point along the way, Wendy realized that she needed, she wanted to do more for women and to advance women. So uh, I want to ask you, Wendy, what was that aha moment where you said, you know what, I'm jumping in here and I'm going to take action? Judy, thanks very much. And thank you to everyone for being here today. Delighted to be with you. So I, I really had two aha moments. I've been in this industry now for eight years. In 2014, Dina Rollman and I, and Dina's with Green Thumb Industries as well, and she's another amazing, extraordinary female leader. But Dina and I founded an organization called Illinois Women in Cannabis. And we had this great idea and we thought, Wonderful, here's this brand new industry. There will be no barriers to entry for women. There will be no glass or grass ceiling. Um, and there'll be no sense of the old boys network. Fantastic, so we convened a group of women to come together to, to highlight all of the great opportunities. And I'm sorry to say that we were dead wrong. Um, all, of the, all of the old barriers were there. Um, but we set out to work on the problem, and Dina and I are both very solution-oriented people, and so all along the way, we've had a really, let's, let's highlight the issues, but let's spend more time um, dealing with the problems and actually being very solution-oriented. And so about two and a half years ago, I decided it was time to pick my head up a little bit outside of Green Thumb Industries, and while my first obligation is to our shareholders, um, I started looking to invest in women in the industry. And my aha moment really came when I was looking at about five or six deals. I still was looking at some deals that were not companies founded and led by women. And I'm a spreadsheet kind of person. And so I put all the numbers in a spreadsheet. And what quickly came out of the numbers was it was very clear that women were raising at discounted valuations to their male peers. So revenue revenues to revenues, revenue projections to revenue 
and projections, forget about EBITDA because that didn't, it doesn't and didn't exist in startups. Um, and the women were, were raising at significantly discounted valuations. And while on one hand, that's a great opportunity, it also highlighted the problem for me. So I decided that this was my moment in time to make a mandate for myself. I only, outside of Green Thumb Industries, I only invest in women founded and led companies. And I think it's really important as we all look at cap tables, we all sort of hide on cap tables behind entities. I decided to create an entity that would make me very clear. So I created an entity called Woman Backing Women. And all of my investing in women is done through that. And that was really my aha moment and really catalyzed me to a very different type of action. And that action was the writing checks opening my networks to all of these women and doing programs like this to really talk about it. And again, always solution oriented. And you provided a tremendous amount of value to each woman that you invest in. Which I is am really critical. proud. Yeah, I've now invested in eight female founded and led cannabis companies. And yeah. I spend time with all of them and they are all extraordinary leaders. Yeah. So let me introduce you to Whitney Beatty right now. So Whitney, join us. So I have known Whitney since I started Amity. She and I were both pounding that fundraising pavement together. And I remember that you won the ArcView Big Pitch Contest. And part of that, uh, along with her great idea, Papa Carey, she'll probably tell you a little bit more about that, was also she's an incredible storyteller. And she brings that from her experience in entertainment, and that's been hugely helpful, I think, to you in the fundraising area. But also, um, she has created amazing retail experiences as well, and has uh, created Josephine and Billy's dispensary, which you're going to learn more about, and you're going to see some pictures. But first, I want to ask you, Whitney, what was the moment that spurred you to start addressing the female market and working with women as a group? Well, that's a great question. I mean, I've been a black woman all my life. <laughs> um, and, you know, so coming into the cannabis space, I had a couple of those aha moments that kind of got me activated. And the first was going to my very first cannabis um, conference and being the only black female in the room. Uh, and realizing, you know, what that meant for, you know, for me, um, not being able to really see other people who looked like me um, doing what I hoped to do. Um, and as I move forward, you mentioned Apothecary, that was my very first company in the cannabis space. We do ancillary um, goods, so sleek and sexy storage and humidity solutions for cannabis connoisseurs. Um, and when I started going out to raise um, the very first investor that I spoke to told me that um, black women are not luxury and thus no one would invest in a luxury brand ran by a black woman. Um, and on top of that, I had um, a lot of people actually, you know, even from my family who were telling me that um, you know, I was really risking a lot to get into the cannabis space. You know, basically the story was, you know, it's, you can be a white guy in the cannabis space, but as a female and as a black woman, you're going to end up, you know, in trouble. This is not a good place for you to be in as a mother. Um, and anybody who knows me knows that the best way to get me to do something is to tell me that I cannot. Um, so... <laughs> Um, I think all those things really taught me that it was really critical to grow a community of women um, and also women of color within the cannabis space. I mean, you know, straight up, uh, communities of color have been disproportionately disenfranchised by the war on drugs for years and, and legalization. I want to see women and um, women of color doing well within the space. And the key for me um, was being able to, how do I share insights? How do, as I grow, bring other people along? Um, and that really sparked for me the, the activism that um, I continue with this day. It's what made me seek out to join Supernova Women, which is a 501c3 that seeks to encourage women of color to become stakeholders in the cannabis industry through education, advocacy, and networking. Um, and what we really do is prep businesses 
um, for growth, prep women led businesses for that next level. There's a lot of organizations out there that are doing 101 type of things and being able to grow and show people 201 and 301 and really help um, as we come together, grow those businesses into something that is formidable. Um, I think it is gonna be key for the future and it's something that I'm definitely passionate about. One of the things I love about this industry is that the people are such advocates and maybe it's because our, our industry grew out of advocacy and, and revolution. Um, and I hope we create one in this particular way. So thank you. Um, let's meet Jean Sullivan. So Jean is a legend in the cannabis industry. I've known her since I first got started. She was my mentor at ArcView. Um, her advice was incredible and, and really focusing and helped me prioritize. And, um, but uh, maybe even greater than all that contribution that she's give, she, she gave to me and that she gives all the time to lots of women is how she does it. She is the most positive human being on the entire planet. She is the biggest cheerleader for women in cannabis that I've ever met. So um, we definitely have to hear from Jean uh, because she's been doing this for a, a long time. This isn't your first time to support women and, and, and find this important. But was there a moment where you actually decided, you know what, I'm gonna spend as much of your time as you do um, at helping to advance women? Totally, Janine. Thank you so much for having me today, because I love to share this story. And I also love what you said about being invisible. Wendy, I love what you said about supporting women-founded businesses. And Whitney, the stupid notions that people have about women and Black women, come on. All those things flip uh, on in my brain many, many years ago. I've been supported and loved promoted and helped by women all my life. So this is my give back. From early on, I'm the oldest of a lot of kids. I have, there's five girls in our family. I had an incredible mother. So all that shored me up. And, and so uh, I was a VC back in the day and in the, always in tech also. So through the eighties and then in the early nineties, I was a co uh, general partner in a VC fund. And people would ask me to speak. Well, where are the women? Where are the women investors and entrepreneurs? So I did the research. What? We are, as you all know, a little bit more than 50% of the entire world as far as population. We make 90 to 95% of the business decisions. We, uh, we make the decisions about our household, our husband's clothes, our clothes, uh, our kids' clothes, where we live, what car we buy, what insurance but we're not anywhere in the C-suite. And back in the day, there were only seven women as CEOs of Fortune 500 companies. I went, what? Now, luckily that stepped up just this year. There's now 41 CEOs. That's still only 8%. Like what? We're nowhere in the compensation committees or the executive committees. This shocked me years ago. I said, I got to do something about this. So that was my first aha moment. And then being in this wonderful, wonderful cannabis industry, I said, especially because I've been a tech investor for many, many years prior to cannabis, and I am all in on the cannabis world since 2014, uh, I saw I didn't want our beautiful cannabis sector to be run by just rich white men. And uh, so I was determined to make a difference there by supporting women. Um, uh, I run a fund in Arcview. Uh, we have a DNI mandate. I make sure we are seeing the women. The door is open to meet women founders. I work tirelessly to help them, to inspire them. And we want to bring in those healthcare professionals, investors, women entrepreneurs, and inspire them to, to join us in the industry. That's one way we're going to make a difference, taking our talents, our, our backgrounds, and leveraging. We want women to join us in this sector in a wide variety, and we can help each other do that. That's part of my journey. Uh, it's, it's a passion for me, and I will continue that in our sector to my last day. And so I, I just love uh, being part of that, showing people the way, showing women the way, 
and also inspiring. There are a few good men out there who have this passion. So welcoming them to help us with this mission. Back to you, Jim. Well, thank you so much. We're so grateful for your tireless advocacy in here. And, and I, what I, one of the things that I love about what Jean said and also what Whitney said is that women can use the support across, from, not just from 101, how to get into the industry, but all the way up to the top, we have to be, help each other because we have to start. When, when a woman is this, made a CEO, she will hire six times more men, uh, women than a man will. So that's one of the ways we're going to close this gap. Yes. And Janine, let me just add one thing that's so important. The research has already been done. Why do women just get like 2% of the VC financing? And why is it so hard for women? And the research has been done. It's because we need more women investors. Like you heard what Wendy's focus is. There's a few good men who get it that women have so much to bring to the table, especially in our sector where we need women products, uh, dispensaries that are welcoming the women. So I'm just really focused on bringing more and more women to the table as investors. Mm -hmm. And we're going to talk about the supply chain in regard to women shortly. But first, I want you to meet Laura Sinton, Laura Wilkinson. Sinton. Um, Laura and I became friends because we were both on the NCIA's marketing and advertising committee together. Um, she is a super doer. She's tenacious, she's super smart, she's everything that you want in an entrepreneur. And now, because of this incredible determination, and um, she has just won a lawsuit against Chula Vista, which is a town that denied her application for a dispensary. She was one, the only woman of 84 candidates. We won't say that has anything to do with it, but she was denied, even though her, her proposal was absolutely 100% in accordance with what they asked. So she sued them and she won. So she's turned that around and stood up for not only herself, but I think all women. And so Laura, um, you're, you're creating a dispensary that is targeting women. Um, Thank you. And, and tell us a little bit about why you're, you've decided to go in that direction. Well, um, I actually applied for three dispensaries and did the appellate process with the city first. And the, the city manager actually granted all of my appeals and said, no, you need to rescore her and you need to put her in the queue. And for some reason, the city doubled down on their mistake, which was a mistake on their part. Um, in California, for those of you not from California, cities and municipalities get to have the final say on how many dispensaries there are and who has them often. Um, some do a lottery system, some do a ranked merit-based. And uh, actually, a shout out to Jean Sullivan and the ARCU group, because their consulting group helped us put together a lot of, uh, a lot of our business plan, a lot of great stuff there. Um, but I didn't take no for an answer. It, they didn't process it appropriately. And, you know, this is one of the things women tend to, to be a little timid when it comes to litigation. You know, not a lot of them would go as far as I did. And I got to tell you, I was really, I had some moments where I was crying in the shower going, how am I going to afford this? How am I going to do this? Um, but it just, you have to have belief in yourself and you have to surround yourself with women and men who believe in you too. And um, in the cannabis industry, there are so few of us to start with. And it, it's really hard to change some hearts and minds. So I use hard data and spreadsheets. And those are languages that pretty much everybody in finance um, and in, in litigation tend to understand. So um, being able to kick that door down has really been um, really been heartening. And I want to encourage anybody else if, you know, don't take no for an answer. Make, as one of my heroes, John Lewis, used to say, make good trouble. And another hero of mine, Brian Stevenson, used to say, use the courts when, when, when you're wronged. And it won't turn out 100% of the time. Um, but if you really believe in your cause and you're really passionate about what you do and you have good counsel around you, um, that that can be a path that can be open to you. And it's one that, thank goodness, has worked for me um, in this particular instance with the city of Chula Vista. We're also applying in other places in Southern California. We have another application pending with the city of National City. And my partner there, my 51% partner is a Latina who is brilliant, um, you know, Harvard educated, first generation, you know, mother was a farm worker, father was a Tijuana welder. 
um, comes from a great family and she's a public policy executive who's from National City. So we've known each other for a long time and decided to partner up on this a while ago. And I, I found that when I partner with women, I am so much more supported and, and move forward faster. And, and that's been my experience. Um, the other thing is play with big dogs and contribute in your industry. You know, being involved with the Women's Inclusion Network with ArtView and with NCIA, meeting people like Janine years ago here at NCIA, um, I didn't have the time, but I volunteered to help out on a committee. And that's where you meet other women. That's where you network. And that's where we start to elevate each other as we go. So mm -hmm. that's kind of my experience there. Um, just background, I was in the industry since 2015 in Bend, Oregon, where I owned radio stations. And we advertised for dispensaries there in Bend, Oregon, starting in 2015. So we got to know the business pretty well there. And I thought when Prop 64 passed in California, I am there. So, and I am serving with panelists who are all my heroes, including Brad Bogus, who's one of our greatest allies, because we need men as allies too. Thanks, Jeannie. We're going to hear more about Laura's um, retail concept, but now our secret weapon, Brad Bogus, let's meet him. So, Brad coming on. So, um, I was looking for the right male ally to join us on this and to represent some of the things that he's done. I was looking for somebody who was very active, had a big passion, and Brad's name also kept popping up. So I spoke to him, and he's fun, and he's funny, and he's a little bit of an anarchist, which I can appreciate. As I said, coming out of this industry, as, as Brad pointed out, we, it's part of our heritage. He does have some revolutionary thoughts, uh, which he's going to share with us, I think, a little later, which I think can move the needle, well, and more than move the needle, change the game. And Brad, why, what made you become such a fierce advocate for women and minorities? Uh, <laughs> I'm like so incredibly overwhelmed by what you both just said to me. Uh, I, I feel so honored to be joining such rock stars literally on this panel. I, Hardly believe I've deserved it, but uh, I will take it. Thank you, humbly. Um, I my kind of uh, aha moment initially was punk rock. Um, I grew up in a redneck Texas town, and none of it fit. I didn't feel uh, comfortable there. I felt like there was a lot of hate in that society, and uh, I I discovered punk rock. And for the first time, I heard um, white men standing up for oppressed peoples and um and really out front loud not the way necessarily that the hippie culture did it which is you know i'm not knocking i'm just saying very different uh punk rock was like fuck you we're not taking this anymore we're going to say something that needs to be said and we're going to say it out front and we're going to raise these issues to the forefront and make society deal with them and that was it for me i was just like i'm in this lane um a further aha moment happened uh, many years down the road when uh, I got married and uh, my wife, Stephanie, pointed out to me that I listened to a lot of male voices. And, you know, in punk rock, that is true. There are some great female voices out there, but they're few and far between, uh, essentially kind of like female founders and uh, investors in the cannabis space, like a small percentage. So I started really consuming a lot more um, women artists, writers, uh, musicians, uh, exploring a little bit more from uh, women's voices to hear them talk about these issues that I've always heard men talk about, you know, trying to get other men involved. And the one thing that I'll say I've heard um, around uh, every conversation I've had with women wanting to see change or with people of color wanting to see change is they want white men to stand up and do something and fix white men and fix the systems of oppression that are punishing everyone below white men and social status. And um, there's only so many times you can hear that call before you realize you're ignoring it if you don't stand up and do something. And so that's what led me to the cannabis industry, I wanted to see social change. And um, I did, uh, I think, uh, as Wendy pointed out earlier, I, I had a little bit more of a positive understanding of where we might be as an industry. And over the course of the six years since I've joined it, um, a little bit more of that reality has set in and I see how much stronger we need to actually stand up and fight and how much white men literally need to be the ones to do a lot of this work to change these problems. Um, you know, um, as much as also women need to support each other. But um, that's that's why I'm here. That's why I've been doing the work I've been doing. Um, that's why I'm really thrilled to be working with Cannabis Doing Good, who's been doing that work for you know the last six plus years um, and working for two amazing women uh, whom have taught me a lot about the differences between calling in versus calling out. So I'm here to call people into the work. 
And just so you know, all the panelists and the conversations we had prior to this, it was all the panelists, what they said that turned into the solutions. So when you get your 32 solutions at the end, this is your source. Brad has also put a lot into that. So thank you all. And if everybody will turn on their cameras, good news, we're all at the right spot for the time check. And so what we're going to do next is I'm going to direct some questions to each of the panelists, but the other panelists are, should feel free to jump right in and, and add to these questions as we go. Um, and then we have a little ending piece, uh, but, but let's jump into those questions. And I'm going to start with Dean. I mean, it's a question for you. So when we were talking about this panel, um, you said that you knew of 90 open job recs for people in retail at Curly. And that led to the question, well, how can women break down these big MSO doors and get their foot in there? You know, it's not only Curly, but it's many MSOs, SSOs, uh, smaller MSO groups, women led and founded. If you go to a conference, CEOs stand up and say, do you know what the number one uh, most precious resource is? It's people. So it's hard to find dynamic, responsive, responsible, hardworking, knowledgeable people to work in these companies, not just licenses, but all in our industry. This is a pervasive issue. So guess what? You got to find your way. I don't believe in going in cold. It doesn't work. You need to network your way. Guess what? You know us now. Send me an email. It's hard for me to have a conversation, but it's easy to respond to an email. There's plenty of terrific recruiters out there who are serving those recruiting needs. They like it when somebody sources another person. And so you got to find your way. Now, speaking of that, I have been to the last two lobby days pre-COVID. I have made a couple of lifelong friends from NCIA's very well organized lobby days, which were so fabulous. That's one way to connect. This past weekend, sorry you all, couldn't be in the Hamptons. We had a fabulous cannabis e expo. I live in New York City and people are getting together all the time. Go to your local events, go find where people are convening and find your way. That's one way to connect in and that works. Back to you. Wendy, I know that you work with MSOs. Um, do you have any suggestions for how do how do women, you know, a lot of times we don't play up our strengths as much as we should. We're not maybe as brash, we're not as visible. What do you have any advice for how to stand out in the pools of candidates and get who is probably a male hiring manager? How do you get that guy to hire you? Oh, I think you really need to be bold and courageous and be very proud of your accomplishments and your skills and not afraid to talk about them. Sometimes as women, we have a habit of not, A, not speaking up and not being our own biggest champion. Um, and so this is, uh, this is us taking the initiative unto ourselves. And I do think it's important because, you know, I'll give an example, and I, this is a made up number, but ish Green Thumb Industries right now probably has more than 500 open job positions, right? 500, a lot of people to hire. I think last year we hired over 2000 people. Um, connecting to someone to work your LinkedIn networks to get a warm introduction. And that person is not going to be able to get you an interview but they can perhaps um, elevate your CV or your resume to the top of a pile. So really trying to get those warm introductions in a sea of hiring. So if you think of, uh, of somebody in a hiring position, they're overwhelmed. It's a lot of resumes. How do the resumes stand out? So, you know, accomplishments and networking. Those are my two, two first suggestions. Anybody else have anything that they'd like to add to this? Okay, well, we're going to move on to talk to Laura, uh, ask Laura about creating a female-friendly culture. 
Uh, what do real retailers need to do when it comes to uh, letting women know that they're most welcome in their establishment? Let me well, just say um, before you yeah. jump in, I go sure. to a lot of dispensaries and typically I find that I'm greeted by a guy in his 20s. He's always high as possible. He rarely, if I go like, you know, if I ask for advice, he doesn't know how to advise me. I've now taken to saying, hey, what's the freshest? What did you just get, you know, in? And then they don't even know that. So that's what happened yesterday. So Laura, what can, what can retailers do? Well, hey, you know, there is a place and there's an audience for that 28-year-old bud tender who's, you know, going to obviously partake of his own product while he's at work and make his recommendations. But the fact of the matter is, I'm not going to take advice on what I should use for menopause flashes from a guy who is young enough to be my son. So really, uh, if you look at the, the screen there, this is really interesting research. And I try to back up everything I say with data because it's not just me saying it, it's the scientists. Um, but I see our spectacle to 2020 did a study on cannabis consumers. And as you can see, 46% of cannabis consumers say they want to patronize women-owned cannabis establishments. So there aren't enough of them out there. There just are not enough of them out there. So they want to do that. They don't have the opportunity to buy their weed from women. Another 44% in the same study would give their business to minority or veteran-owned cannabis establishments. Were they able to source them? So I would think that would be a really critical part for any investor to look at and, and for women who want to be entrepreneurs to look at the fact that the data is there. They want to patronize them. We just don't have a mature enough market yet. And if you look at Whitney, well, then damn near everybody wants to go to her dispensary. And if you live anywhere in the Los Angeles area, or I live in San Diego, and I drive up there for it because I want to patronize that. I want to support that. So in that same study, too, 28% of women, only 28% of women feel very comfortable walking into a dispensary. And for me and for my partners, we're in an area that is majority Latina and has a lot of Filipinas. So we are hiring women, we, when we get our license and finally get it built out, our plans are to buy or are, are to um, make sure that women can feel comfortable buying from us. And that means having representation in the store. I need to have a senior citizen Filipino women who speaks Tagalog to be able to speak to these other consumers that are coming in. Um, anecdotally, I can't tell you the number of middle-aged and senior citizen women um, you know, white, African-American, Filipina, Latina, that I have driven to a San Diego dispensary because they're afraid to go in there, you know, especially in a border town where you've had 30 years of TV news talking about evil cartels and drugs. You know, it's hard for people to get their head wrapped around. That's still, you know, we're in the industry, so we think it's all fine, but the average person out there in America still is a little concerned if they're not cannabis users and if they're not buying cannabis from legal dispensaries yet. So there's a lot of education that still needs to be done and people trust people who look like them. And if you want those consumers and if you look at America and you look at the data in where you live, if you want those people to buy your products, if you want those people to patronize your cannabis establishment, you got to have people that look like them. You've got to have diver diversity is not just something that you say and something that you talk about in your CSR reports or your DEI reports quarterly or at the end of the year. It's something that you have to live and you have to bring it in to your entire culture. And that includes your hiring practices and that includes the people at the top. Because if you want women in cannabis to be in executive positions, they've got to be able to see women in executive positions right now to feel that it's going to be possible. This is a great segue to Whitney because Whitney went, you know, the rubber hit the road at just Beans and Billy's. You know, Whitney has created a, an environment that's incredibly welcoming to women. So Whitney, what are some of the elements that every retailer should be considering when they say, well, you know what, I, I want to attract more women? Um, great question. And, um, you know, some of the stuff, you know, Laura talked about in, in her conversation, but I think really what we need to be doing is focusing on the needs and wants of that female consumer and then turning that into the experience. You know, what we started with, with Josephine and Billy's is, you know, really looking at how females shop. Um, women want to know how is this product going to affect them? How is it going to help them? How is it going to make their lives better? Um, and then use those ideas to be able to build the store around. So for us, that meant that our store is designed by terpene profile. 
it's a much better way for people to determine how cannabis is going to affect them, how it's going to make them feel. Um, and so we start off by talking to the customer about terpene profile, being able to give them that opportunity to um, know that everything underneath our relaxed section is going to be something that's myrosine forward. And so if they like something else that's in there, you know, you might like the new the product next to it because it also has that myrosine forward. Um, being able to you know, have a, a more control over their experience um, is important. We also use special labels in our store. We have a champagne glass rating system. Um, whereas, you know, some females are not familiar with can, um, cannabis, lots of them are familiar with champagne. So it becomes much easier for me to say, hey, this is, you know, a, a one champagne glass experience versus a five champagne glass ex experience. Because if they leave there and then they go home and, you know, eat 100 milligrams, they're going to come back. You know, they're not going to come back. Yeah. They're gonna be like, oh, that newfangled weed was way too much. <laughs> and I'm not coming back to Josephine and Billy's. Um, and I'm not coming back to this industry. So we really need to make sure that we're doing um, right in the information category. Also for us, it's having those products out to touch. Um, you know, for me, shopping is a tactile experience. I want to be able to pick up that product. I want to be able to look at the packaging. I want to read what's on the back. Um, and so that is important um, for us in our store. Also, you know, uh, Laura talked about it, you know, knowledgeable advocates that represent the community um, are incredibly key um, across the board because you want to talk to someone who um, who represents you. And I think that that is really important for us. Um, and also being able to be knowledgeable enough to know that we need to have some private quiet areas that people can ask questions that might not be comfortable. We make sure um, on placement of, you know, our suppositories, our, um, some of our sex products, some of the things that we think that people might feel uncomfortable with, we have it in an area so we can come over and have private conversations with them um, and not feel like, you know, they have to tell the whole uh, store about their reproductive issues. Um, I think that it's also really critical that we think about um, who we have buying for the store. You know, my business partner, Ebony, um, does the buying for Josephine and Billy's. Um, but what we're seeing uh, across the board is sometimes we're not having the option to get some of these women-led products, these lotions, these, you know, uh, sex oils, these suppositories, because the buyers are male and they don't believe that there is a demand. Um, and it also becomes an issue for those women-led brands who are making those products um, as well, because they're not getting that shelf space. I think it's critical that we focus on diverse product lines and what we've seen in store is though people were like, oh, this won't move and this don't, won't move. Um, those are the, some of our best sellers because uh, they don't have an opportunity to find them other places and people aren't gonna give them the education and information that they need to use them effectively. Um, so that becomes really important. Uh, for us, it's also about pushing in on um, education. Our store we have in our back room. Uh, we have a lounge. It's not for consumption yet. Uh, we have books all around the store where people can take that book off the shelf and go back in our lounge and read it because, um, especially in communities of color, we don't have access to that sort of education. We want to let people have the opportunity to gain that. And we also have a huge um, display that is the history of cannabis timeline um, that we use a lot with also with our older um, customers, uh, our grandmothers, if you will, um, that goes through, you know, starting in 1400s with Sway Thu Woman using cannabis in childbirth all the way through Harry Anslinger all the way through legalization. And it really does help give them an idea of cannabis is 3000 years of plant medicine and 70 years of um, you know, stigma because of a guy, you know, Harry Anslinger, who said, reefer makes darkies think they're as good as white men. Um, so once you can put those things in context, you really get to open up that consumer um, and makes them uh, more willing to try the plant. Um, and also for us, it's, you know, uh, also very being, being very event based. Um, you can't even get me to get out of the car at a Target anymore. I pop the trunk and put my stuff inside. Um, so what makes someone want to step in the store? For us, it's our educational events. For us, it's, you know, we're going to have yoga. We're going to have Pilates. We're going to have um, our tea and terpenes event where people come and drink tea and learn about cannabis. How do we interact with that customer and really make them feel like they're part of that community? I think that matters for that female shopper. Janine, I just wanted to add something to what Whitney just said, which is to say, she, she mentioned something earlier, which is that these things appeal to all buyers. And um, I, I mean, I want to fly to LA to visit Josephine and Billy's, but I also attend yoga events and cannabis tea events. Like, 
these things are fantastic as well. They're, it's it's so awesome to experience cannabis in a normalized way with many people. And I want to go to a place where my wife feels comfortable whenever we're able to go out and enjoy cannabis together. And those are the events that she feels comfortable. And guess what? So do I. Just because I'm a guy doesn't mean I can't drink tea. Like, I don't understand why these things have to be so siloed off in the male mind when it comes to decisions made. But these things appeal to men and women, and therefore you can get better market share. Like, it's just like, like Laura said, use the data. What, what are we doing? And you're not wrong, Brad. I mean, 40% of our customer um, is still a male customer um, and majority of white males. And they come in because of those things. They're like, we like the education. I'm not getting this information anywhere else. We like the vibe here. Um, you know, so even when you're designing under that lens and building under that lens, um, that doesn't mean that that's the only person you're attracting, not by long shot. Yeah. You know, Brad, when we were talking, one of the things that you brought up was the supply chain, the issues across the supply chain. I have a different question for you, but I'd love you to just talk about that observation that you made about the supply chain and how it is already stacked against women. Whitney, you referred to it, and I think you did too, Laura, but Brad? Yeah, I mean, you know, there, there are plenty of uh, female butt tenders out there that need to be more, obviously, but um, when, when you have your front line, uh, you have women on the front line who understand products, but they don't have the right products in stow, like, like on the shelf to suggest for someone who's dealing with menopause, right? Like how are they supposed to be able to suggest the right things for them? Right. And so you have to look sort of up the supply chain a bit and it goes beyond just even the buyer in the store, you've got the distributors, right? What, what dec decisions are distributors making as to what products to distribute from what growers or producers out there, right? And so a distributor is making similar decisions that a retailer is making. Oh, this won't move, right? So if it doesn't move in their heads, they're not going to, to uh, pick it up. But the problem is like, Dude bros aren't going to understand why a Foria suppository is important, but like almost every woman will, if you just have a little bit of information to tell them, here's what this thing does, they're going to get it, right? So, you know, the, these, these are all subjective decisions. They're not making these decisions based on like the proper data analysis. They're looking at it and saying, this isn't what I would do, right? And this problem has resulted in us with mostly 25% plus THC strains on the shelf too. It's the same problem, right? It's 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 bias uh, happening all throughout the supply chain. It might even also be happening at the grower level in terms of what strains they're deciding to grow, what chemical profiles they're producing within their um, their doors. And, you know, all these things are interconnected. But if we're not looking at these problems all throughout the supply chain, if we aren't ensuring we have women buyers and women making decisions in the distribution, women making decisions in the product lines that are going out into the world and using data analysis to make those decisions, then, you know, there's just always going to be a missed opportunity there. And there's always going to be a ton of consumers that feel left out and unseen. Um, so the, the supply chain is very much responsible as much as the retailer to, to make decisions that of what goes on the shelf. Great. Um, I, I just wanted to ask you another quick question, which is about, you know, you've talked about advocating for women and running into men and just say, hey, well, I just can't find any qualified female candidates. What do you have to say to them? <laughs> Why aren't you trying? <laughs> Seriously, Thank don't you. find them, right? There are uh, networks of professional women out there. You can just go to a LinkedIn group for Christ's sake. Like they're there, right? But if you're only following the same path that you've followed and that has been treaded on for many decades now on how white men hire, then you're just making white men hiring decisions, right? Um, I, I, I've uh, worked for a tech company where the founders all had the right belief system in place, right? They were like, we want to support women. We want a more diverse work culture. Um, and, and I was like, cool, let's hire more women and more people of color then. And well, you know, you, you can't really just say that. And there's like labor laws and, you know, we have to do this and this with our language and our LinkedIn profiles. And, and what happens is they, they make the same decisions. They still are looking for white people in their sphere of influence because their sphere of influence is made up of white people. It might not even be that overt. It might be extremely subtle, but they are always constantly making biases, discriminating towards white men. And, uh, and I think that uh, even the well-intentioned white men out there that want to have a more diverse culture continue to use the same system that was built to oppress and keep white, like women and people of color out of the workforce. So um, what we need to do is use that system against itself, right? Like 
uh, following a labor law in terms of how you decide what types of uh, candidates to raise up into your interview pool or what so what, what candidates to hire, um, you know, you're using the same system of oppression in that regard, and and you're following laws that have been made by the oppressor, right? Like the war on drugs was a racist. Um, you know, white supremacist patriarchal system that continues to wreak havoc to this day. And hiring decisions and anti-discrimination laws are not stopping white men from continuing to hire white men. In fact, they are continuing to commit the crime of discrimination in the way that they are uh, choosing who to hire. And I think we need to do it right back, right? We need to prioritize women and people of color when we're making hiring decisions. And that might mean, you know, I mean, I'm not saying go out and like, write a big email about how you're choosing this on, on purpose. Like, you know, don't get yourself uh, sued. What I'm saying is make decisions in your brain and prioritize them. That's the only way you're gonna fix Brad, it. If I could just punctuate on that. Um, Please. I think I think of the story of a law firm in San Diego that was, but zero diversity, all white males. And they made a conscious effort. They hired a Latina out of law school, right? Cause they're like, we gotta do something. Let's hire a Latina. Well, what they didn't realize when they hired her is she brought this huge network work with her because she spoke yep. Spanish and knew all, all the bilingual, uh, you know, all, all the, the Latino men that were running construction companies. And, you know, she, the, they immediately got that network that they didn't even know existed. Yep. So it was a huge client base that they got to grow from. So that's one of the reasons why diversity works from a financial standpoint, because they're bringing these networks and these new potential customers and supply chain people with them. Yeah. So because of time, what I'd like to do now is just let, give each of you a moment to uh, tell the audience if there's only one thing they can do, you know, what's it going to be? So let's start with you, Brad, because you had the stage a moment ago. So what's the one piece of advice you have for our audience about what they can do to change the game for women? I mean, um white men are the people in power right now and um frederick Douglass always said that power is never seated without demand um i think the demand needs to start right here and right here right we need to demand of ourselves to improve i'm not perfect i, I i'm not like always the best ally as much as i am receiving amazing praise um but i'm really not i'm always constantly improving because perfection is a white supremacist idea right you can always just slightly improve on your systems you just have to want it and you have to demand it of yourself to actually do it you can't say i want dei i want more women at the table uh, i want a diverse work culture and then do nothing different from what you've done up to this point right so demand that change of yourself start making decisions today and you know uh be a little risky like you know go out there like actually like change the game changing the game is not a comfortable well-trodden process it requires doing something different and being a little bit radical and I'm, i just think we should do that because we're in the cannabis industry and we're here to to fight the war on drugs like we're still in a federally illegal Little place guys like let's break the law a little bit if we need to right be compliant don't lose your license but you know yeah. make some change uh, 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 can i chime in brad I, i'm just going to take issue with one thing uh, this yeah. is not a business where we can break the law um that's how you lose your business in this business so uh, i'm going to come out strongly against that compliance is everything if you want to be successful in this business 100 percent compliance and this business spills over into your personal lives, right? So, yeah. um, but, so that's my my comment. Um, and Judy, if I, while I'm talking, should I just give my one thing? Yes, you should. Women write checks and spread the opportunities. When you get a deal book in your email, send it to everyone you know, men and women, write checks. Great. Laura? The one thing I would say to do for anyone who's who's doing this is lift other women, make it a point. If it's five minutes a day where you go on LinkedIn and you like and comment on everything that women in cannabis say, do it. Join a group, get involved, network, and you get to play with, I, I mean, I can't run with these big dogs that I'm on the panel with, but look, I'm I'm sitting here in a, in a square next to them. So you can do the same thing, connect with people, Find out ways that you can help them, not just pull from them, but help them. Help other women, lift other women. With, regardless of whether, you know, regardless of what gender you identify with, lift other women. Whitney, what do you have to offer? Um, I mean, I, I gotta back up, uh, Wendy, on, you know, fund women-led brands. 
support women led brands. Um, but I also want to say, um, make sure that you have women and women of color who are decision makers within your organization. It's one thing to have them answering your phones um, and manning your registers, but if they're not, uh, do not have a seat at the table when you're making these decisions, then you've got a problem. Make sure that they have a seat at the table and that they have a voice. And women, when you get in there, be bold, be brave, and believe that you have the power to change things because you do. And we tend to, as women, not believe that we can do that. We're the ones who don't apply for a job unless we hit every single qualification where a guy's <laughs> like, hey, I got a name and, and I've done this once. I'm gonna you know, send my name in. Um, make sure that you own that power while you're there. We all need you um, to, to be a voice for us. Jan? I'm suggesting anyone on this discussion today, find one woman over the next few weeks, support her, sponsor her, which is an elevated type role of really uh, showing someone the way, advise them, connect her with someone that could help. If she's an entrepreneur, find a way to get some good advice to her and potentially a person who could fund her and then we're actually growing our sector in such a positive way. Excellent. So everybody, we have, I don't know if Brian's going to put it up, but we have the 32 solutions to change the game for women. There is a link that's going to be put in the chat for you to use to download that. Pick six of them, do them. And we're going to start, we're going to move this. We're going to change this game. We invite you to join us on this mission and to see our industry realize its potential. So thank you very much. Let's have a big round of applause. What an amazing panel. You're, you guys are incredible. Thank you so much for all you do. We just uh, thank you. And thank you to everyone who's been with us here today and for your interest and desire to change the game. Fantastic. Well, let's throw that big round of applause right back at Janine for spearheading today's fantastic conversation and program. Um, like I said at the beginning of today's session, it was awesome to have had this proposed to us earlier, and it was a fantastic process working with Janine and our retail committee members to develop this program, secure all these amazing panelists, and bring all of you all to this virtual event today. Um, this is by far the most engaged chat room that we've had going on in a webinar in, in the last few months, um, and I don't think that uh, I don't think that it was any. Uh, reason besides that you all were really engaged in today's conversation and, and all had a lot to contribute. Um, so I really uh, encourage all of you all to follow all those connections. We're going to stick around for another three to four minutes. I know that we just hit the um, allotted time, but stick around in the room while we close the today out. Get all of those virtual business cards passed around. Get all of those LinkedIn connections posted into the chat room. Um, and our panelists are going to leave the virtual stage but some of them, most of them are gonna stick around in the chat room. So if you have any additional questions, you have any connection requests, you have any emails that you wanna drop, um, I really cannot thank all of our amazing panelists for not only coming today's conversation with so much to offer to the audience, but really going out of your all's way to offer your all's services and connections and mentorship um, following today's broadcast. So I really hope that we can carry on the conversation um, following today's program on LinkedIn but also for all of our NCIA members here, um, we will, as always, post the formatted video recording of today's session first in our members only community platform, NCIA Connect. So that'll be the first spot that you can carry on the conversation directly with all of our amazing NCIA members that are fellow panelists on today's program as well. So um, like I said, the virtual or <clears throat> the panelists are going to leave the virtual stage. Let's give them all a big virtual round of applause one last time. Post those appreciation messages in the chat room um, and then stick around for the next few minutes while we close out the program and give you a sneak peek on some of those upcoming activities that NCIA is engaging in and would love all of your all's participation with. Um, so first off, dust off that business suit and shine those shoes. NCIA's Lobby Days is back. Um, I saw a lot of you all mentioning um, upcoming activities that you all could participate in, specifically in the DMV area. Um, well, happy to announce that you all are able to join us across September 13th and 14th for the return of our in-person lobby days to the Washington, D.C. area. I really appreciated you mentioning this event, Gene, um, and talking about all the amazing connections and 
um, all the amazing partnerships that it's helped facilitate for you over the years. Um, so we're really excited to be coming back with this event um, and bringing it back to the DC area for a shorter two day version this fall. Um, this will be the um, leader into a more expanded version later next spring on our usual calendar um, for the end of May. So if you have any information, you want to learn more about participation with this event um, or learn more about sponsorship opportunities, please reach out to me following today's broadcast. I'd love to tell you more um, and get you linked in with our most uh, political focused event of the year. Okay, and with that, thank you all so much for participating in another NCIA Industry Essentials Educational Webinar. Um, head to the events section of our website following today's broadcast to secure your spot in all of our upcoming virtual and in-person events. We will be taking a slight two-week break while we prepare for the return of Cannabis Industry Lobby Days. So check our next Industry Essential Webinar scheduled for September 21st, the week after our Cannabis Industry Lobby Days concludes in D.C. A uh, huge thank you once again to all the members of our panel for presenting today's session, along with all of our audience members, and most importantly, our member businesses, which are essential in driving our organization's mission forward. As always, we'll leave you all with this end of a cre event credit sequence, highlighting those member businesses that participated in this afternoon session alongside our evergreen roundtable, which make our work possible each and every day. If you don't see your company listed in this slideshow, don't be discouraged. I saw a number of you uh, answer no to the RU and NCIA member uh, question in our icebreaker poll. Don't be discouraged. That just means that you need to head to thecannabisindustry.org slash join following today's broadcast to join the movement for a responsible and equitable cannabis industry. Enjoy, and we'll hopefully see you again next month for our next Industry Essentials Educational Webinar, and as many of you as possible in D.C. Uh, in a few weeks for the return of our Cannabis Industry Lobby Days. Thank you all so much, and we'll see you again next time.